All right, good morning, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Ooh, that's got some feedback to it, huh? Okay, I'll let you keep working on it while I keep talking then. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. We got uh, some of our shepherds handing out, um, I guess, what do you call it, study guides, class notes, handouts, whatever, for this class. Uh, so um, this is kind of some of the stuff we'll be going over today. There's an area for you to take notes. And then remind you again, up here in the corner, if you click on that uh, with your phone or your tablet, uh, that opens up that Padlet app. And so if you either um, don't want to raise your hand and make a comment or ask a question here in class, or if we're just kind of running short on time and we hold off on answering questions here, you can submit either comments or questions on that on that Padlet. And uh, hopefully we'll get to those during class, but if not, we go back during the week and, and uh, I make sure to look back over those and um, go back and answer some of them. So you can even come back later on this week, like, you know, if, if we don't get to your question today, maybe look back on Tuesday or Wednesday and we should have an answer for you um, if we didn't get to it this morning. So I wanted to remind you guys of that. Make sure you got a handout if you want one, okay? Um, we're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 2. So if you got your Bibles, your Bible apps, go ahead and turn, scroll, click to 1 Timothy um, chapter 2. As you're turning there, just I, again, I want to remind you guys of, of a couple things as we've been going through this study, that uh, we're working on both uh, hermeneutics and exegesis, those two fancy words. Uh, exegesis simply meaning we want to find out what, what a passage meant, when it was written, what it meant to the person who wrote it you know, why they wrote it and, and what it would have meant to those people who it was originally written to. Like, how would they have heard it? How would, what it would have meant to them? And then the hermeneutics part is, okay, once we understand all that, now what does that mean for us? How do we apply that now in 2022? Uh, how do we make that fit um, into, into our lives? So those are the two things that we're working on with every single one of these uh, classes that we've been through, okay? Um, and then up there at the top of your, of, of your study guide, we got, again, those, and this will be important today uh, as well, those two Greek words that keep coming up for us, um, aner, andros, mean both man and husband, uh, gune or gunakos means woman or wife, and you just have to kind of figure out on your own uh, from the context um, which, which way you want to translate that. Is it woman or is it wife? Is it man or is it husband? And so we've been, we've been using those uh, terms a couple of times with some of the other scriptures that we've looked at, okay? All right, so 1 Timothy chapter 2 uh, is where we're at now in a lot of our English Bibles. Um, not all of them, though, I have, I have come to discover. I went and looked through a whole bunch of different translations this week. So it's not all of them, but in a significant portion of them, if you got chapter headings at the top of your chapters, what's one of the more common chapter headings that's at the top of chapter of first timothy chapter two instructions on worship or something to that effect now not everybody has that there's some of our uh newer translations say things about you know um prayer life or or, or something along those lines but a lot of our um a lot of our english bibles say instructions on worship up at, up at the top of that okay and that, I want everybody to understand, Paul did not write that in his letter. And I think we kind of know that, but I think it's, I, I want to be clear <laughs> in saying that, that Paul did not go, let me give you some instructions on worship. Or he didn't write that heading at the top of this uh, paragraph. That's us. We put that there, all right? Um, so the first thing that I want, that, that we need to recognize is that First Timothy chapter 2, when you read through the whole thing, read through the whole chapter, there's... It's, it's not talking about um, how to do things in a, in a corporate worship assembly. When we, the last two weeks we talked about 1 Corinthians 14, that was definitively about a worship assembly, right? I mean, we, we talked about, like Paul specifically says, when you come together, you know, talking about worship time, here's some things that, that need to happen and here's the ways that you need to handle tongue speakers and prophets and things like that. That's not the context, even though some of us have, have been led to believe that or thought that's what it was because of the chapter heading. That's actually not the context of uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. This is not about, this whole chapter is not about what to do in specifically the worship assembly, okay? Um, and, and honestly, there's, it's, it's really a broader 
uh, picture of, our, of the Christian life that Paul is talking about here. So Tom's going to start us off reading um, just verses 1 through 10. We're going to focus on verses 11 and 12 because that's the, that's the part that we get a lot of discussion on. But we want to read verses 1 through 10, if you don't mind. And the one I brought up was the NIV, and believe it or not, it does say instructions on worship. So, I'll, <laughs> so when I was looking at this, I was having to go through that as well. Yeah. So I went, and just in case you do it later, go back to chapter 1. Start at chapter 1, mm -hmm. and then you see he's setting up the false teachers in the everyday life through love type situation. Mm -hmm. Made a little more sense to me. So I've got 1 through 10 first. Yes. All right. <clears throat> I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peacefully and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time, and for this purpose I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. Therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. I also want the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves, not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls, pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. Okay. Thank you, sir. So just here in verses 1 through 10, I mean, we put some notes uh, on the handout for you, but what do you see that Paul is addressing here in this first, you know, couple of paragraphs of, of 1 Timothy chapter 2. Anybody? What jumped out at you? Okay, we need to pray for, we need to pray for all people, even the people that we don't necessarily agree with or like. Mm-hmm, good. Anybody else, what did you see? Are you thinking of the people that you don't like that you need to pray for? I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, you can't buy expensive clothes. <laughs> the That's what the Bible says. You got to go to... Cut the budget, buddy. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very good. So the, the answer was he's calling both men and women uh, to be different. <laughs> men, um, maybe even now, but definitely back in this culture, would tend to be more, um, more aggressive and settling disputes with their fists and things like that. And he says, you know, you need to use your hands to pray. You don't need them to, to uh, you don't need to be fighting with each other. Uh, and for women who might be more focused on the way they look and, and material possessions to focus more on humility and trying to do good things and let that be what what um, people see as the beautiful things about them. Either way, it's causing it's calling uh, men and women to both be, can I say, countercultural. Like this is what the culture looks like and y'all need to be different. Good. Anybody else? Those are really good answers. I mean, if you look at, at the notes that we gave you, I mean, one of the things that, that, you know, as Lou mentioned, God is calling us to pray for everyone, that we need to constantly be praying for people, praying for our families, praying for our church, praying for our friends, uh, but not just praying for the people that we like and that we get along with, but to pray for people that maybe we disagree with, people that may have even mistreated us in some way. Um, and especially when, when um, some of the people in the church that... that um, where Timothy is that, that Paul is, is writing about, uh, they would have, I mean, you've got wealthy people and you've got slaves. And they're called to, to be Christians and be in the church together. Uh, I think there would be some difficulty there. You know, if a slave is sitting next to his master, and I don't want to get into a whole discussion of the rights or wrongs of slavery, just, just commenting on what culture was back then. And for... Paul, they go, you need to pray for everybody. Your rulers, people in authority, 
maybe you got government officials that you don't like that are oppressing you in some way. You need to pray for them. That would be um, countercultural. Okay. Uh, it also calls everybody to live peaceful and quiet lives. Um, don't be ones that are that are causing problems. Uh, try to get along with each other. Try to try to make sure that that you're um, resolving differences and things like that. Um, and it, and the reason for that. Uh, he says, you know, we live the peaceful and quiet lives um, in verse three, in verses three and four. He says, you know, this is a good thing to do. Uh, and, and one reason is because, I mean, it's a good thing to do and it pleases God. God wants us to live peaceful and quiet lives. Uh, and then the second thing is actually living those lives where we're not constantly uh, causing problems or at the center of confrontations. That actually helps our testimony that, that when people see us trying to get along with others, that actually um, bolsters our message about Jesus. If we are living um, life and saying we, we're living the way that Jesus wants, to, wants us to live, well, if we're constantly arguing and fighting and, or being really materialistic, that's, that's not, um, that doesn't coincide with, with the kind of lifestyle that Jesus calls us to live. It can actually damage our testimony instead of helping it. So Paul says live a peaceful and quiet life because God wants you to and because it actually helps people see and get a clearer picture of who Jesus is because they see how you live your life. Does that make sense? Any two cents worth? Well, and that, that whole section there, what I found interesting, and we kind of go into it in the notes later as well, though, but really he's reinforcing the relationships of men and women in the church and with each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's promoting everything that, we, that he's listing there on how we're to act and, how, and what our responsibilities are to each other uh, and that Christ is reinforcing what he's trying, how he's trying to separate the way the Christians were acting versus the, you know, versus the world. Right at that time, we, we knew about Ephesus and all the, all the cults and the priests, the priests and the different religions. This is new, and he's trying to separate the Christians out, reinforcing that role of love and respect and responsibility, really. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very good. So, anything on the pallet so far, by the way? I think we're good. Okay. So I, I want to make sure, as, again, before we get into verse 11 and 12, we need to understand the context of the culture that, that Paul is addressing here, okay? So he's writing to Timothy, he's not, and that's a little bit different than some of Paul's other letters, too. This isn't to an entire church. This is to Timothy. This is to one individual. Now, Timothy <coughs> was in uh, the city of Ephesus. You see that in chapter 1. Um, and so um, he is, uh, you know, leading that church, shepherding that church, but actually Paul... Uh, spent close to three years in Ephesus. Besides Corinth, this is the other place that he spent the most time in. So he's very familiar with a lot of the people um, in this church and a lot of the culture um, in that city, okay? Um, and so I don't know how much you know about Ephesus. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it uh, this morning, but I think it, I think we need to kind of have a clearer picture of the the culture that people were living in where Timothy was trying to lead a church and, and, you know, what Paul is, is addressing there. So, um, Ephesus, huge city back in, um, back in the, this time when it was written. It was one of the main cities of the, of the Roman Empire. It's in the southwestern part of modern-day Turkey. Um, it doesn't sit right on the coast, but it's pretty close to it. It had, you know, um, had a huge harbor down the road from it. Uh, it there were at least two major highways of, of the Roman highway system. That, that came um, through Ephesus. And it was just one of those, those cities that, you know, in the, in the Mediterranean world of the first century, is one of the main hubs of just lots of different culture, lots of different ideas, lots of different religion, uh, lots of people from all over that part of the world that were, that were coming and going, that would stay there for a while and move on. Um, I, I don't, you could probably compare it to something like a New York City or an L.A., you know, maybe in Chicago nowadays, uh, where there's just a lot of different, a lot of different um, cultures moving in and out of that city. Now, uh, one of the one of the main, um, I guess, attractions, one of the, one of the main uh, things about the city of Ephesus was it was the it was the home base, it was the hub of the worship of Artemis, or uh, some of your translations call her Diana. If you go back to the book of, of Acts. And when Paul is in the city of Ephesus, um, he actually gets in trouble, uh, actually, actually inadvertently causes a riot in the city uh, because there are people worshiping this, this goddess Artemis. 
and uh, um, he ends up casting out a demon out of this girl. And um, was that the one? Now I'm starting to get confused. Maybe that was Philippi. Anyway, is that the right one? Thank you. Thank you. Anyway, uh, long story short, he's preaching Christianity. People are converting to Christianity and leaving uh, their, their worship of Artemis. Okay? And the worship of Artemis was such a vital part of the city of Ephesus at the time. It was a major part of the economy. It wasn't just the worship itself. They, had, they sold trinkets and statues. They had, they, there was so, well, let me back up. The Temple of Artemis is one of the original seven wonders of the world. Okay? Um, some of you have seen, what is it called? The, what, what's the big temple in, um, in, is it Corinth or Athens? Whatever the, what is that? I didn't go to it. I never went to Europe. You know what I'm talking about? The big famous temple that's on the... Parthenon. The Parthenon. Thank you. I could not think of it. That, that word was just escaping me. Um, the Parthenon. The Temple of Artemis, uh, at its height, was at least three, some people think, even four times as big as the Parthenon. Huge structure. Uh, and people would come and worship, and they you know, make financial offerings as well as you know, animal offerings and things like that. There was so much money flowing in and out of that temple in the worship of that goddess that it had its own bank. It would be like the Bank of Artemis, you know what I'm saying? Like there was so much money attached to that. And, and the, the worship of Artemis was, was um, it just infiltrated the whole city. Everything that people did, you know, it's... Mm. I, I want to get myself in trouble if I say it's similar to maybe companies around here in Northwest Arkansas, so I won't name them by name. <laughs> but there are some companies <laughs> in this area that infiltrate a whole lot of our lives, right? Even if we don't necessarily work for that particular company. Can I say that and be on everybody's good side? Okay. Um, so it, it would be the same thing. I mean, I want you to think about that. The worship of this goddess was that important to that city of 300,000 plus people that everyone had at least an awareness of who Artemis was and how she was to be worshipped. And because Artemis is a female, you know, is a goddess, um, there was the, the, um, the uh, status of women in Ephesus was elevated compared to other cities. We've talked about that, right? I mean, in the Jewish culture, women were just above slaves. Uh, and in the Greek and Roman culture, they were a little bit higher than that for most of the empire, but not in Ephesus. Ephesus, women were almost on an equal plane uh, with men. There were as many or more priestesses that were involved in the, in the worship of Artemis and the leadership of, of the temple and all those kinds of things um, as there were men. Because, uh, you know, she was this goddess that, that would reveal her will uh, to women. Then women were, um, were very outspoken in Ephesus. Uh, and, and like there were some of them, there were city officials. You didn't see that in most of the other cities of the Roman Empire. Uh, in their homes, um, they, they would become, in some of their homes, they were more dominant and kind of told the husbands, I don't know how to pick it up and lay it down or whatever. And, you know, like they were the ones that, that kind of dominated the home, especially compared to, again, other cultures and stuff. Not saying it's good or bad. I'm just telling you how it was. Okay? That's, that's the culture of the city where this church is. That can't help but have an influence on the church itself. If you've been raised in this culture where... Uh, uh, women are much more dominant and much more outspoken and are allowed to be so. Um, and now they've become Christians. They've let go of the worship of Artemis, but not necessarily the influence and not necessarily how they live their lives. And those people are trying now to be Christians and try to be um, in a church with each other. And oh, I also I forgot to mention um, these priestesses um, throughout the city were known to, and I mean, you can go back and look at ar ar archaeological things that they found. They were known to uh, really adorn themselves in lots of jewelry and having their hair done up in different ways, lots of, of 
more opulent clothing, and you just kind of knew, I mean, because they had wealth anyway, but just the way they adorned themselves, as part of their worship of this goddess and part of their saying we have um, the authority to speak on behalf of this goddess, even just the way they dressed, kind of carried that kind of air with it, that, that sense of authority. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's, that's, who, that's who's in this church. So we can assume, and Tom was right a second ago when he said, you know, there's a lot of things going on throughout the book of 1 Timothy that are not just about this one particular scripture. And one of the things that is happening is um, there's people who are, who are getting wrapped up in a lot of false teachings, but they're, they're preaching them anyway. Uh, there's, there's people who are wrapped up in wealth and materialism. Read through chapter 6. That is almost all about, hey, you need to start being content with what you have and quit worrying about making more money for yourself. You need to be rich in good deeds instead of rich in, in wealth. There's a lot of things that are happening in the culture of the church where Timothy is that Paul is addressing and telling Timothy specifically, this is how you need to lead that church. This is, these are the things that you need to address and try to make better. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Any questions about any of that before we keep moving? My... These, these other classes, my sleeve hasn't covered up my watch, so Monty, I may need more of your timekeeping skills today. <laughs> okay. Was there anything I forgot of the notes nope. that we had, Tom? We're covered all the way. To okay. 10, 9, 11. Okay. So this, so again, that verses one through ten. Uh, once you know that, um, the background, I guess, of the city of Ephesus and the culture they lived in. That, that kind of helps verses 1 through 10 make a little more sense, doesn't it? You know? Um, and, and especially when he's talking about how the women are supposed to, supposed to dress and supposed to adorn themselves. You don't need to look like the, and there may have been some of these former priestesses that are now in this church. You don't need to worry about your ability to, um, and the wealth that you have, the ability to dress yourself up and all sorts. I don't think Paul's saying that braided hair and jewelry is, is evil. I think he's saying that doesn't need to be where you get your sense of value from and where you want other people to get your sense of value from. It needs to come from good deeds. You need to be a servant. You need to do good stuff and let people see that in you. Okay? So then we get to verses uh, 11 and 12. And I guess go ahead and read through verse, um, just go ahead and read through the end of the chapter. But start with verse 11, please. Very well. And just as a side note, we did not talk about lifting up holy hands today. We'll save that for another <laughs> study down the road yeah. on what he meant by that one. That's a different different class. We'll, see, we'll start with 11. Yeah. A woman should learn to qu in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and become a sinner. Uh, but women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Okay, so I don't know if we'll even get to the whole Adam and Eve and childbearing thing today. Um, it just seems, I, I'll just tell you ahead of time, it just seems kind of weird. Like, Paul, what are you talking about there? So we're going we're gonna to put that on the shelf for now. We may get to it, okay? Um, but verses 11, 12, that's, that's where we have a lot of discussion, you know, uh, in our churches about what, what is Paul trying to get across there. Women supposed to be, because it seems like he says, you know, women, um, I got to read it again, women should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man. She must be silent. So this is where um, we had discussion on exactly what, going back again to what women can or can't do, uh, what roles they can and can't have uh, in the church. And a lot of folks, uh, have looked to this or these two verses and said, see, like a woman can't uh, teach a class, a woman can't uh, preach, a woman can't do something where she's up in front of everybody else uh, while we're worshiping or at least while we're in the church building because that is going against what Paul says here. She is, she's supposed to be silent. And so she can't speak out loud, but not only that, like she can't teach, she can't, um, do something um, that looks like she's leading something if, if there are men that are in the room, if there are men that are present. 
Why? Because that would be exercising authority, or some of your translations may say usurping uh, authority, you know, over a man. Okay? Now, we got to be careful. We've said this a couple of times. We got to be careful about lifting two verses out of the entire context. That's the first thing, okay? And a lot of times that's, that's what gets us in trouble, uh, is, is taking something completely out of the context that it's in and going, okay, I'm just going to take this piece. It just reminds me, this total side note, a um, bunch of teenagers over the years came over to our house a lot, and Christy uh, would, would um, always or, or consistently make cookies or brownies or sometimes cake, um, for, for the kids, and we always knew if we left it sitting out, even if we didn't know which kids were coming by, if we came, by, came back to the kitchen later to clean stuff up, we always knew, it, and I'm totally throwing them under the bus in front of everybody right now, if Cooper Bowman had been to our house, because Cooper Bowman hates the edges of brownies and cakes, and so there would always be a square right in the middle of the brownie or, or the cake. Every time. It doesn't matter. So if you ever have the Bowmans out of your house, just know Cooper doesn't want an edge. He wants, <laughs> he wants, so um, I just think of that when I'm thinking about taking stuff out of context. Like, yeah. okay, we got the whole cake, but I just want this piece right here. And that gets us in trouble sometimes, okay? So we need to, need to be cautious about that. Uh, the other thing that I do want to point out as, as we get into these verses, and we've given you on this handout, we've given you like three different ways that you um, can look at this three different ways that our leadership as we've studied this together three different ways that that we have said well this is how you can approach this or this is how you can view this text okay and you can make that decision what you think it says but I do want to point this out when uh, Paul uses the word um, quietness in verse 11 and silent uh, at the end of verse 12 does anybody else have a different word than silent by the way in, in whatever translation you're using or does everybody have silent quietly Okay, quietly or silent. That Greek word, um, the original language, the original word that's used there, is the same word that's used back in verse 2 uh, when Paul says, um, when we're supposed to pray for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives. That word that we translate as quiet lives, the same word that Paul uses here in verses 11 and 12. So, if we go with the, the, the interpretation that women are to be silent, don't say anything when the church is together, then if we're using the same word, then we would also have to say that the rest of us, as we're living our peaceful lives, we have to be silent. Right? We're going to be consistent. So, I, when I go to work... When I'm around my family, when I'm in the neighborhood, when I'm watching my kids play soccer, I can't say a word. Why? Because we're living peaceful and quiet slash silent lives. Okay? So, I just want, I want everybody to know that's the same word. When you, look at, when you see this word quiet or silent in verses 11 and 12, it's the same word that Paul's already used to describe our entire lifestyle. Okay? Just throwing that out there. All right. One option uh, to look at this, and one that probably most of us are familiar with, is to say that Paul is, is saying that all women have to learn about God's word and God's will um, for their lives in silence. A woman is never allowed to teach a man. Uh, a woman is, is never allowed to hold any position over a man, at, at least in churches, um, that is deemed a position of authority um, by the church. And a woman is not allowed to speak in the worship assembly. Does that sound familiar? Okay, and that's one way that, that, that you can look at this. And maybe that's, that's how you were taught. That's what Paul is saying here. Okay, um, if that is the case, there are some questions uh, that I feel like we need to ask. All right, one is, does this apply? If, if we are saying that women in the church have to be silent and can't be in a position of authority at all in the church. Does that apply to all women for all time in every culture? Or is Paul just addressing this church here? It's a question we have to consider, right? 
be fair to the text. Okay? Um, does this mean that women can't sing along in the assembly? Not lead the singing, because that would be a position of authority, right? But can they sing along? Because he says we want them to learn. Are we learning from our songs? Are we learning about Jesus from our songs? So are, are they supposed to learn in, in uh, silence? Can they, and this goes back to, I, I, I'm not, I really, I don't want to come across as like I'm trying to dig at you or poke at you. I'm, these, are, these are things we have to consider. We talked about this when we looked through chapter 14 as well. If we are saying that women have to be silent in church, how far do we take that? How, you know, if you run that to its end, we are talking about total silence, right? No singing, no um, speaking to each other. Good morning, how are you? Well, you've already messed up because you made a comment in class. You weren't supposed to do that. <laughs> uh, I, can we even go so far as in clearing their throats? Is that because that's making a noise? So... They have to do that quietly, or I guess walk out in the lobby or, or something. Um, does this mean that women, um, that all women, are not allowed to speak in a way, just in a way uh, that would be deemed um, leading or, or teaching in the assembly? In other words, they can, they can sing, they can participate in worship, but they can't, they, they have to be silent. They, they can't be um, teaching in any way or leading in any way when the whole church is together. If if that's the case, where do we draw the line as far as, first of all, what's, what constitutes leading? Uh, second of all, is there a difference between here on stage in the big room and in a classroom down the hall? And some people would, be, would say, well, they can't speak in here, but they can there. And some people would go, no, that's, a, that's still teaching, so they can't there. But they can teach kids. But then we got to decide, like, at what age can they not teach kids anymore? Right, And I think it's important, as we were going through this uh, together with the shepherds and Marshall, you know, we're, we're just coming up, we're just trying to let you all get a feel for where do you come with these scriptures, kind of like us. Mm -hmm. but we were asking some of these questions that I've just asked. Well, I, I, I know it comes across me asking rhetorically, but these are some of the things we're like, hmm, huh, well, we got to wrestle with this. And what was the most interesting to me, now keep in mind, I was raised, I was raised small church, uh, church of Christ my whole life just up the road, so so. This is, you know, I've gone through a lot of different thinking through this, but it was interesting, no matter which one we came up with as our options, if you're going to hold tight to this is it and only it, just like these questions, well, you got to have some problems because there's boundaries that could get you in trouble with each way you come out on this. Mm -hmm. But the important thing that we kept coming back to was, and we, as we look at each one of these, wherever we, our comfort zone gets and what we believe uh, the manner was supposed to be, it's supposed to be down in love and respect, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have to be, remember where our relationships are to each other, mm -hmm. men, women, and the church, spe specifically going back to Jesus. That's kind of where we kept coming down, going, these questions seem interesting or weird, but it's real. Yeah. Because if we just draw the line under any one, each one would go, you know, there's going to be a shortcoming somewhere. Because <laughs> you could go as far as you want to go, yeah. Or as little as you want to go, but each one you got to be careful. At least for us, you got, anyways. You, you have questions to answer, yeah, for sure. And the other the other thing about that is is uh, going back again to women being completely silent and never having a position of authority. Can they be in charge of uh, ministries in the church if there end up being men involved in those ministries? Like you know, women can be in charge of, of women's ministries, but they can't be in charge of, let's say, you know, connection groups or things like that because. There's men involved in those things, and that would be having a position of authority over men. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, and I, I see your question. Hold on just a second. So just to, just so we can hear online so everybody can hear. The question was about the, the uh, Greek word that we translate as um, to have authority. 
uh, and what that word actually means, if it, if it means to be in a position of authority <clears throat> over another person. And honestly, um, the, the Greek word, and I don't know, David, is this what you're going to address? Or you got a different question? Okay, so that's the question. I'll answer. Let me get David's question because they may be connected. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. But you're going to go do your own thing. <laughs> right. Right. Yes. Yeah, there was a different... It was, just, just religion in general. Christianity... Worship of Artemis, all these different religions had more of a, um, it, it, it influenced more than just what people did when they were in their particular building. It was part of, it was part of the economy, it was part of the laws, all those kinds of things. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Uh-huh. Right. Yes. Hmm? Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the comment there was uh, our our English word usurp uh, that we that we use that some translations use here it means to take something by force, and it's not necessarily uh, being put in a position um, of authority. It's I'm I'm taking that. Uh, but if someone is told to do something, even in a leadership type way, they're not, they're not aggressively taking that. They're just doing what they've been asked um, to do. So going back, I, I think I can tie all that together. That Greek word uh, that you brought up is the only time in the entire New Testament that, that Greek word is used, by the way. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't mean, um, I mean, authority is probably the best English word that we have. But it literally means to, to put oneself first, okay? That's what the literal meaning of the word is. So I am aggressively putting myself in front of, uh, and it does have that aggression piece to it as well, but I am aggressively putting myself in front of someone else. I am, I am um, stampeding my way to the lead, uh, stepping over or on people to get to wherever it is that I want to be. That's what that word means, Okay? So I think Paul would say, you know, men shouldn't do that either. <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, uh, Jesus' entire ministry was about having a servant's heart, right? Um, but in this, in this context, um, I do not permit a woman to teach or to aggressively assert herself uh, over a man. Might be a, a, a better way um, to say that, okay? Good questions. Yes, ma'am. Well, that's, that's a question, isn't it? And the question is, you know, if women, if women are supposed to teach uh, men, if a woman encounters a man who is not a Christian and wants to tell her about, or tell him about Christianity, does she need to go find a man to do that for her? Uh, or is she allowed to teach him uh, herself? It's a good question. If we're going to, if we're, this is what we're talking about. If we say a woman can't teach um, or be in these leadership positions, when you, when you carry that out to its fullest extent, you run into some problems, okay? I can already tell this is going to bleed into next week. So let's, let's, let's keep going, and we'll find a place to put a, a, a bookmark. Dave, go ahead. Uh, it could be... Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, 
Well, yes and no. I, I agree with you. I can just share my story. Am I necessarily uh, teaching like biblical information or am I just sharing my story of what God has done in my life? But I will say this, uh, that word to teach, man, that's used a whole bunch throughout the New Testament and in different contexts. Uh, when, when uh, I shouldn't, I'm not going to say it because I may be wrong. There's just different times um, when, when it is people just sharing their story or just sharing what they know about Jesus, and that word is used, okay? So I think it could be an either or. I think I could just be sharing my story. Here's what God has done in my life today or this week or over the last few years. Or, or maybe answering questions about it, okay? Let me, let me do one more thing real quick. If you got more questions, put them on the Padlet. We'll get to them, and we'll, we'll definitely pick this up next week. I thought we could get this done in one week. It's my fault. I, I, I didn't, I didn't we, say we, we, anti we anticipated <laughs> there's going to be a few times that we'd have to roll over. Well, we so scheduled we, Chapter 14 to take two weeks. We yeah. just thought we'd get done with this, this in one, and I was, I was wrong about that. So, okay, real quick, that, that's one option, right? Okay. Second option uh, that you have listed there is a woman, should, a, a woman should learn about God's word and God's will for her life in a submissive way. Because he says, I want her to uh, learn in, in, a woman should learn in, in quietness and full submission. Uh, a woman who has knowledge should not aggressively assume a position of authority over man. In contrast to what um, Ephesian, women in Ephesian culture may have been accustomed to. So the way a woman learns about God um, should be with the same heart, the same attitude uh, that she's trying to live a peaceful and quiet life. So this kind of goes, this, this concept goes back more to, uh, especially in verse 11, just we're, we're matching up with what Paul has already said um, in verse 2. And this is not about total silence, but rather about submiss submissiveness uh, and trying to get along peacefully with others, okay? But still, a woman is never allowed to teach a man uh, nor is she allowed to hold any position over a man that is deemed a position of authority by the church. So this, this is kind of a, we're not being as harsh about, you know, women being in total um, uh, silence and, 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 and never um, allowed to do anything, but they need to have a submissive heart. What Paul is addressing here is a submissive heart and a submissive attitude, which, which would be countercultural to what was going on in the city of Ephesus, okay? Now, it is time for class to end, so let me let me give you a teaser for next week, all right? Um, what if instead of translating this as man and woman, because the Greek word is interchangeable, what if we translate? What if we read this as husband and wife? Okay, so I'll read it that way, and then we're going to pause, and we're going to talk about it next week. All right, so just look in, in verse um, eleven, twelve. Well, if we read it this way, a wife should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a wife to teach or have authority over a husband. She must be silent or she must be quiet. It's a different way to look at it. That's where we'll start next week in class, okay? If you got more questions, more comments, put them on that padlet. It'll be up for a while. You're, you're welcome to, even throughout the day, so if you're studying this on your own and got another question, put it on there. And if we don't get to it this week, we'll get to it next Sunday, okay? Thanks for your time this morning. Appreciate it. Worship will start.